والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه من استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين رب العالمين إن شاء الله in this brief discussion I'd like to share with you a, a, a profound lesson based on a handful of ayat I've selected from Surah Al-Baqarah and one of those ayat the center of this discussion is actually a, a interrogation uh, it's an interrogative statement made by Allah to the messenger to the followers of the the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it goes am turiduna an tas'alu rasulakum kama su'ila Musa min qabl do you intend to question your messenger like Musa was questioned before this is the first part of the ayah am turiduna an tas'alu rasulakum kama su'ila Musa min qabl do you intend to question your messenger as Musa was questioned before the latter part of the ayah is وَمَنْ يَتَبَدَّلِ الْكُفْرَ بِالْإِيمَانِ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ Whoever replaces uh, their faith with disbelief, iman with kufr, then they have gone far off the path. Okay? Now, the first part of the ayah just spoke about one issue, questioning the messenger. It said nothing about leaving Islam. It said nothing about, you know, walking out of the faith and say, I no longer believe in this. All it said was, the criticism was, questioning the messenger. The latter part, however, declared that questioning of the messenger as tantamount to what? Disbelief. So it's a pretty strong statement, right? To, to say that on the one hand, uh, all you did was ask a question. And on the other hand, the Lord is responding, your question is now equal to your iman, your faith being negated altogether, you're considered a disbeliever. It's a pretty strong statement, and one has to understand that properly. And it has very strong and powerful implications for us as Muslims. Forget even others, among ourselves. Now, to speak about, to understand this context properly, we have to travel to the life of Musa alayhi salam. Because in the ayah, in the ayah, when Allah tells us, are you questioning your messenger? He didn't just say that. He added one thing. He said, do you intend to question your messenger as though Musa was questioned before? And if you study Surah Al-Baqarah, there are multiple instances where Musa is being questioned by his supposed followers. Okay? But I want to walk you through a very simple scenario, not too many elaborate you know, technical discussions, very simple scenario. You imagine yourself as a, one of the followers of Musa. You are, you've come to believe that he's a messenger, and you belong to the, the, the children of Israel. And he's challenging the Pharaoh, right? He's challenging this, this power at the time. You mess with him too much, he'll execute everybody. And he's challenging him day in and day out. And there's this debate going back and forth. And tensions are rising. And you're, you're the follower of Musa, and what you see is nine signs come from, you know about the history, right? Nine signs that were given to Musa a.s. To, to give Pharaoh an idea of who he's dealing with. He's not just dealing with this man, but this man represents and has been sent on behalf of the Lord of the Worlds. Now, let's fast forward, and now the children of Israel are about to escape the clutches of the Pharaoh. They're at the brink of the water. The armies are raging from behind. The cloud of dust is rising. These guys are thinking, we're going to we're get killed. Musa a.s. strikes his staff, water parts, and they cross. Now, imagine you were in that gathering. At that point, if you had any doubt about him being a messenger, those doubts would have disappeared. At that point, you mean before then you said, I'm following along, I think he's a messenger, but, you know, we'll see. And maybe right before the water parted, there's a person in that audience thinking, man, I got myself killed for nothing. I, got, I listened to him, he's, he talked pretty convincingly, and I followed him along, but now we're going to get killed. But as soon as that water shifts, you say, you know what, I want to be Rabbi Musa wa Harun. I believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun, and you follow along, right? Now imagine... This person who followed Musa along in this miraculous crossing of the water, they get to the other side and they start questioning Musa's judgment. They start questioning him. When he tells them Allah says something, they say, doesn't make any sense. Are you kidding? Are you joking? Right? Atattakhiduna huzwa, do you take us as a joke? Is that what, that's what they said. Do you see a, a rational problem with that? Once you've established that this man doesn't speak on his own behalf, and you've experienced with, with unequivocal proof that he in fact speaks on the Lord's behalf, 
then whether what he says makes sense to you or not, the room, the question is, him has disappeared. And if after experiencing that miracle, being convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that he does in fact speak on behalf of Allah, even then if you question him, isn't that the same as saying you don't really believe he's a messenger? It is. Because the foundation was, I came to conviction, absolute conviction that he is in fact a messenger. The point I'm trying to make is the ayah said, questioning the messenger is, is the same as disbelieving. It put those two things together. It put them in an equation. Why did it do that? Because you, the only person who would question a messenger would be one who would say, well, I agree with most of the things he says, but some of these things don't make sense to me. Therefore, they can't be correct. But when you say, I agree with this and I don't agree with this, it's as though you're debating with a human being. Like if you and I are sharing ideas, you can agree with some things I say and you can disagree with some things I say. But if you've acknowledged that this man, yes, he's a human being, but he doesn't speak on his own behalf. His, his, uh, the laws he's speaking of, the ethics he's speaking of, the principles he's trying to make you live by, are not something he came up with, but that were given to him, right? Then whether you understand them or not, there's no room for questioning. There's no room for questioning left. And if you still have questions, then the only possibility is you don't really truly believe that he's in fact a messenger. Now that's, that's one side of the scenario. I want to make sure you understand the other side, the other balanced side of the picture, which is this. Is it okay to question, to ask questions about the religion? Absolutely. That's actually encouraged. The companions would continuously ask the messenger questions. So then there's a difference between asking questions of the messenger and questioning the messenger. You understand the difference? When we pose a question in Islam, it can be a question, I don't understand this. Or what is the correct way of doing this, right? Or I'm doing this, is it right or wrong? These are questions, fine. Or how do I do this? That's a question. But asking a question is not the same as questioning. Why does Allah say that? Why, does, why is zakah this percent? Why do I have to pray five times? Why is it that I can't have relations outside of marriage? Etc, etc, etc. You can't ask those questions because it, now you're not asking a question, rather you're questioning God Himself. You're questioning the Messenger, which basically is the same as questioning Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because we know He doesn't speak on His own behalf. Now, once this is established, and I'll share with you an interesting conversation I had just to give it some uh, a reality, a taste of reality. A few weeks ago, it must have been more than a month now, I was in a city where I was invited to speak to some teenagers at, at a brunch. So a couple of girls from the family, you know, Muslim family, and you know, they've been raised but they didn't really learn Islam formally, right? And um, what happens is they come and the, the father says, these girls have some questions and I'd like you to try to answer them. So they gave me like a long list of really weird questions. They just came prepared with it, right? So well, the first girl, you know, she says, well, you know, uh, a couple of my friends are gay. What's so bad about being gay? What if they haven't killed anyone? They haven't stolen any money? They, I mean, they're good people. What's so, what's so bad about that? Another question after that, she says, well, why does God want to punish people in hellfire? Why does even hellfire exist, etc., etc.? And the list of questions just went on and on and on and on and on. And you know what? I said, I said to both of them, and this was actually shocking to the father, because he thought they just have questions about Islam or questions about the religion. They didn't have questions about Islam, they were questioning Islam. There's a difference. So when I, when I came to the root of the problem, I asked those girls this question flat out. Do you actually believe this man named Muhammad وسلم, we say وسلم, but the one who doesn't believe doesn't say it. Do you actually believe that this man received revelation and whenever he said something is right and wrong, it wasn't his opinion, it was the position of the divine that we have no say in. Do you actually believe he spoke on behalf of God? And both of those teenagers said, actually we're not so sure. We're not so sure. These are Muslim kids. They've been raised as Muslims in Muslim family. But you know what? They're in the outside world. They, they, they're faced with a lot of questions, ethical questions, that contradict what they learned at Sunday school, or what they learned here and there off, you know, off chance listening to a khutbah. So they've never been able to reconcile the two things. And when you're not able to reconcile, one of those things get weaker and the other gets stronger. And because they're not constantly reinforced or taught Islam properly, guess what's going to get stronger? 
the, their, their doubts are going to get stronger, and their conviction that Islam gets weaker. So none of their questions, I could have given them a proper response. You know why? Because there's only one question you have to ask them. Do you really believe he's a messenger? If you answer that question, and if you're convinced of that answer, then all of these questions automatically disappear. They disappear. And to conclude this issue, what I want to share with you is an ayah from the Qur'an which is really profound on this subject. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, He reveals laws. And sometimes, He gives us a rationale for those laws. Sometimes. For instance, with alcohol, one of the early revelations is, وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا Their harm is greater than their benefit. For alcohol and gambling, there's more harm than there is benefit. Before they were absolutely forbidden, it was hinted that they're bad ideas. Though you might get some money out of it sometimes, or there may be some benefit that comes out of it. In the end, the harm far outweighs the benefit. That's, that's a hint. Now, Allah doesn't have to even tell us that. He could just say, don't drink and don't gamble. That's it. End of story. He doesn't have to explain to you and me, well, it's, you don't drink because it has this, this, this side effect. Okay? Or because it does this, this, and this to your liver. Or you might drink and drive and get killed, etc., etc. He doesn't have to give any of these reasons. And even if someone says, well, alcohol is haram, alcohol is forbidden in Islam because of spousal abuse and because of violence and because of incidents at clubs and things like that. Look at all the harm alcohol produces. That's why it's forbidden. That's actually an incorrect position. The correct position is, why is it forbidden? He said so. That's the correct position. Now, why did he say so? Maybe we'll learn something about why he did it. Maybe we'll learn some benefits of the law. But in the end, we're never really going to know truly why is it that this law is in place. We may know some things about it, some benefits of it we can see. But the whole picture we can't see. This is why Allah says, Asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum. It's very possible that you really like something and it's harmful for you. And it's very وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ And it's very possible that you detest something, you find it disgusting, you find it unacceptable, but it's better for you. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And it is Allah who knows, and you have no idea. You don't know. You're not the ones who know. So the, the concluding ayah that I wanted to share with you, just to bring this point home. Allah puts a scenario in front of us which is really remarkable. This is the uh, 66th ayah of Surah An-Nisa. Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّا كَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْ اِقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ if we had ordained upon people, if divine law was revealed, that they have that people should commit suicide, kill themselves, people should kill themselves, or that they should leave their homes, they should expel themselves from their homes, become homeless despite owning or having a home. Now let's think about this. The half half of the ayah again says, if it was the case that the Lord said, kill yourself. And if it was the case that the Lord said, leave your home. Allah said, leave your home despite owning a home. Don't, don't go back to your home again. Allah says, even if He said something that irrational, because both of those things are clearly irrational, right? That don't make any sense to us. But Allah is not saying if it makes sense or not. Allah is making one point. If He said it, لَكَانَ خَيْرَ لَهُمْ No doubt it would have been better for them. It would have been better for them. For what reason? Because it makes sense? No. For the simple reason that it is He who said it. it is, that's one, that's the, the heart of the matter that's being driven home. Now why is this subject critical? And then we'll open the floor for some discussion inshallah. The subject is critical because Muslims nowadays, most of the questions that the average Muslim has, that hasn't had any real chance to convince him or herself of Islam, they were kind of bored into the religion, or they came into the religion kind of half-heartedly, etc. They didn't really thoroughly get a chance to ingrain themselves into conviction of this religion. The kinds of questions they have aren't questions about Islam. Most of the time they end up being questions, questioning Islam itself. Questioning the validity of a particular hadith. The validity of a particular principle in the Qur'an. The validity, the rationale behind something. And even if I'm able to give you the best possible rationale, what's the ultimate rationale that's the only one that's going to stick? That's the only one that will never waver? The rationale is, it is from Allah. How do you get to that rationale? You get to that rationale when you're truly and absolutely convinced that this in fact is a messenger. So the real question to ask, and the real question to make common discourse among Muslims and non-Muslims is, is this in fact the word of God? Is this in fact the truth? Is he in fact a messenger? Is it true that in fact when he says something and does something and lives by something, it is not because he wants to, because that's how the Lord wants him to. And therefore that's how the Lord wants us to. That's the essence of the discussion and I pray that I was able to...
clarify these concepts to you with, with uh, some degree of description. Inshallah ta'ala. Okay, here's an explicit question. So uh, I hope you have high tolerance for this kind of content. But anyway, I'm having a hard time giving up sex with my girlfriend as long as I give her dawah. Is it okay? Will Allah punish me? So many people are doing far worse. You know, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm a student of psychology. And I read into things a lot. And if you study the, 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 the language of the question, it's the, really the last statement that this person made that's the key. He said, so many people are doing far worse. Actually, by the tone of the question, I already know that he knows it's not okay. I already know he, know, he, feel, he wouldn't be asking this question if this person thought there's nothing wrong with it. The fact that he asked this question, there's something in his conscience telling him, I'm doing something wrong. And to beat that conscience down, to not be able to have to answer yourself, because you have to live with yourself at the end of the day, the best thing to do is get somebody else to tell you, man, it's alright, you're doing okay. It's okay. So really, that's, that's actually one way of getting yourself to go to sleep. You know, your kid is, the kid's whining and he's not going to sleep, you give him a little pat and he goes to sleep. That's what's going on here. Right? A lot of people, they engage in sin, and so long as somebody else can come and tell them, it's all good. Then they can live with themselves. So I urge this person, with all sincerity, with nothing but love and sincerity in my heart for this person, I don't know who they are, that they find it in themselves, that, that little guilty conscience they have, is a gift from Allah that they shouldn't choke and kill. <laughs> that little tiny conscience will save you. This is Allah, it's so powerful that, that conscience that Allah put in you, that guilt that led you to ask this question is so powerful, Allah swears by it. Allah swears by the guilty self, the person that feels guilty on the inside. So use that as a means to come closer to Allah. That's the first thing. The second thing here is so many people are doing far worse. And this is a very important thing. For the Muslim, in the Quran, in the Quran, there are two kinds of groups that have already been outlined in Surah Fatiha. Surat al ladhina an'amta alayhim on one side, the path of those who you favored, who you showered favors upon, and then the other two groups, غير المغضوبي alayhim and الضالين, those who earned wrath and those who were lost. So two categories, the good and the bad, basically. The Qur'an is full of depictions of great people, and then the Qur'an is full of depictions of really terrible people. Why these two extremes? We don't really have like somebody who's not that bad, kind of alright mentioned in the Qur'an. <laughs> We have amazing people mentioned, and then we have horrible people mentioned, <laughs> right? Because we are being shown the, the, the nth degree of these things for one reason. Because if you think that you are okay doing just a little wrong, you're not really that bad, then your archetype is the one who commits sins but doesn't acknowledge their sins. Who does something wrong but doesn't feel like they did anything wrong. You know the first one to do that, to do something wrong, but not feel that they did anything wrong? That's Iblis. You know, he refused Allah's command. He didn't make sajda. And what was his response? I feel bad about it? No. What? Wait, I have a perfect explanation for why I did it. Right? You created me from fire. You created me from clay. So that attitude in and of itself, that attitude of justifying your sin begins, it's a legacy, a continuation of the legacy of shaitan. That's what the continuation is of. Now here, the, 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 the key answer, inshallah ta'ala, is as follows. As a Muslim, as a Muslim who's concerned with their salvation, with concerned that they will stand in front of Allah, we always compare ourselves to people that are better than us. Not with people that are worse than us. This is the first key principle. There will always be people that are worse than you, and there will always be people that are better than you. The guy that kills a hundred people will say, at least I didn't kill a thousand. Because I know of someone who did, right? So there's always going to be someone worse. So if that's your measuring stick, if you're saying so many people are doing far worse, then there's no end to how low you can go. <laughs> there's no end to it. But if you want really to improve yourself as a human being and you want to be true to yourself, the one you compare yourself to are people that are better than you. And even bigger advice, and this is taken from the linguistic aspect of the Qur'an, when we ask Allah to guide us to the path, the, the, Allah says, An'amta, the path of those who you favored, it's in the past tense. The, the word favored is in the past tense. Meaning, we don't look for role models, first role models in our time. We are to look for role models in the past. 
because they've already finished their entire life and passed the entire test and gotten the seal of approval from Allah. The people who are alive today may or may not. They may be good today, they may not be tomorrow, there's no certainty. But the people of the, fa the, the past are concrete role models. This is why we ask for people to, you know, the role models are in the past. Of course, the ultimate role models, who are these people? An Nabiyin, wa Siddiqeen, wa Shuhada, wa Salihin. Right? These are the four groups of people that Quran articulates are the role models. The prophets, those who confirm the truth in the prophets, the companions. Compare yourself to a companion. And it's not like these people are the companions, it's not like they're perfect people, they're human beings. So when I say compare yourself to those people, a lot of times you get stories in the khutbahs and lectures and things like that of scholars that would stay up the entire night and pray and they would never look outside their window and they died reading their books and then you have this, this uh, sahabi who's always making dhikr of Allah like these super human beings that just never made any mistakes. They're human beings. They're human beings. They did make mistakes. They did do things they were embarrassed of and they came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked, I messed up, what am I supposed to do? That's the best place to look. Did somebody make this mistake before? Have they done, was there acts of even zina among the Sahaba? It, this, it, this did occur. It did occur. And because they, they didn't know any better, you know when you come, you're, you're in jahiliya, you're in ignorance. You've lived a life of promiscuity, you don't care about what you do. All of a sudden you take shahada. Do you think in one day you're going to turn your entire character around and all your habits will disappear? No, it takes time. So the companions, sometimes they messed up. And they were training process. And they would come to the Prophet ﷺ and said, I made this mistake. I did this, I did that. And the Prophet ﷺ would tell them how to repent and come back. And he would keep bringing them up. So instead of justifying your mistakes, be like those who came to the Messenger ﷺ and acknowledged their mistakes and then asked Allah to forgive. Right? This is, this is really the way of the believer. Inshallah. For a uh, question? Right, we'll yeah. take a question from uh, the brother on the side. Your turn to say it. Uh, my question is, how do you answer a non-Muslim who's questioning Islam? Okay, good. Non-Muslims ask all sorts of questions about Islam. First thing you should know about questions from a media and, and uh, a media studies point of view is the person dictating the questions is the person dictating the direction of the discussion. Okay, if you know, if, if a talk show host knows what they're doing, they can bring a guest on the show that is of a completely opposite point of view and make them look like complete idiots. How? Even that, if that guest knows way more than they do. What's the only key thing? You decide what questions to ask. As soon as you start hearing an answer you don't want to hear, change it to another question, then move on to another question, then move on to another question. If you study the Qur'an carefully, it is also, in addition to being guidance for humanity for all sorts of things, it is also guidance for how to do da'wah and how to deal with questions. You have the scenario in the Qur'an where certain people of the book came to the Messenger وسلم, and they tell him, well tell us who Jibreel is. Or tell us who the people of the cave are. Who sends you revelation? What is the reality of the ruh? What does ruh really mean? Right? And this, when he would answer one, they'd go to the next. He would answer one, they'd go to the next. And they would keep jumping from question to question to question. Now what happens in the beginning, you have a person that has a sincere question. Right? They genuinely want to know one issue of Islam, like we just were listening today. Well, why do you guys grow beards? Maybe it's a genuine curiosity. Okay? But then there's another kind of questioning of Islam. Why do your women cover? You start answering that in a convincing way. Well, why do you have beers? You do that, and then why do you? And then you keep going, going, going. And like the eleventh question is, why do your women cover? And you say, wait a second, that was question number one. You just this guy's just going around in circles. So Muslims have to be a little sharp in being able to tell: is this person really asking me this question, or are they just trying to run around in circles? We have to have that much street smarts, basically. But the the heart of the matter is this: when you are asked a question, especially a critical question, like you Muslims have this crazy law about fighting and killing everyone, or blah blah blah, something like that, right? I'm reminded of the story of Musa a.s. Musa a.s. walks up to Fir'aun in the middle of the court and says, I am the messenger of the Lord of the Worlds. Deliver an arsil ma'iya bani Israel. Right? Deliver bani Israel with me. Fir'aun looks at him and says, didn't I raise you as a boy? He changes the question, doesn't he? And then he says to him, uh, you know, didn't you do that thing that you did? What's he referring to? The murder that he committed, right? Didn't you commit that murder? Fir'aun is smart. He doesn't want to respond to the statement. He wants to change with other questions. So if you study that dialogue, you learn a lot about tangent questions. But if you study the responses of Musa, he gave brief answers to his tangent questions, but kept coming back to the central question. 
And it is really that central question that's the heart of my topic. When Muslims ask you, or non-Muslims ask you about any one issue of Islam, try to find a way of tying that back into one central discussion. Is the Qur'an the word of God? Is Muhammad the messenger of Allah? You, wanna, you want me to answer that question for you? Yeah, 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 what makes you so sure he's a messenger? And that's an interesting question to non-Muslims, by the way. It is. But that's the question we want them to ask. All those other questions are actually avenues, they're windows, but you want to get them to the door. Right? Now, whether they accept Islam or not, that's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you want the direction, the, the, the conversation to be directed in the proper direction, whatever questions they ask, your best response, for example, on the fighting issue. Well, it's in the Qur'an, and first of all, there's a specific context where it applies, but we believe it's absolutely true, because we believe that the Qur'an is the literal word of God, and Muhammad wasallam is his final messenger, who didn't speak on his own behalf, he only spoke on behalf of the Lord of the Worlds, and we're absolutely convinced of that. Like, he didn't make anything, any things up on his own. He didn't make that up at all. You want me to tell you why I'm so convinced? Right now, you've, what, what have you done? You've changed the direction of the discussion. And this is really how we change. We, we have to force the discussion into that direction. And really, it's not something that Muslim, non-Muslims are averse to. But this is something that we have to learn to do with all kinds of tangent questions that come our way. Like, you know, a, a woman is told, why do you wear hijab? She shouldn't say, because it protects my modesty. Or a Muslim the man should say, well, because, you know, you have a shameless society and look at all the consequences, at least we have, our women cover up and they're humble, blah, 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 and the hair is a distraction, etc., etc. No, forget all that. Get, you know why? Because God told her to. Well, how do you know God told her to? Because the Qur'an says, so how do you know Qur'an's word of God? Let's talk. You see, what, you, what, you, what you're doing is you're forcing a different direction to the conversation. You want to take a written question, inshallah? My business seems to take me away from getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what should I do? This is a problem for a lot of good Muslims too. Um, actually, it was a problem for myself also. Um, you know, when you get tied up at work, then even if you take a break to pray, and you make wudu, and you're standing there, and you say, Allahu Akbar, and you start praying, your, your head is still at work. Right? If you're a programmer, and you're writing code, and you left it halfway, and you, made, you started praying, you're finishing the line in, in, your, in your salah. Oh my God, I missed that slash. Right? I gotta go back. So this is actually a very normal thing. If you're running a business, right, and you left the cash register with a clerk and you forgot to tell him how to press the button that the thing comes out, in your salah you're like, oh God, should I, what's going to happen if a customer, that's what's going on in your head, right? So, uh, you know, mixing work and remembering Allah together, especially salah, is a very, very challenging thing. You know, Allah says, uh, there's a diff distinction in the Qur'an between the believer, al-mu'min, Al-Mu'minun, right? And al Amanu. There are two phrases in Arabic that are used in the Qur'an for Muslims. Al-Mu'minun, those who truly believe, the true believers. al Amanu, those who have come to believe. And it sounds like they're the same thing. Believers, those who come to believe. But they're actually very different statements. They're, and, and they're significantly different in how they're used in the Qur'an. Just to make a complex matter simple, al Amanu, which is the common phrase, is verbal. It's a verb. And al-mu'minun is a noun. And the difference between a verb and a noun is a noun is permanent and a verb is temporary, right? When Allah says, alladhina amanu, He's speaking of those who entered into Islam. They said, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, and they entered into Islam. When He speaks about al-mu'minun, He's talking about a special breed of the Muslims who have firm conviction and they are actually the most mature, solid people of faith. Not every Muslim is like this. You have to earn that title. Now why am I bringing that up in a question about remembering Allah or having a relationship with Allah? No matter what your business, what your job, what your career, whatever it is, Allah installed a, uh, an automated mechanism, a divine given mechanism, so no one, whether they live in a desert, or they live in, 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 a, in a jungle like New York City, or if they live out in the middle of the woods, doesn't matter where, they will remain connected with Allah through what? Salah, the prayer. Now this, but you can't just pray and think you're connected to Allah. You have to have this special secret ingredient in your prayer that will keep you connected to Allah. If you don't have this ingredient, your prayer might become shallow and empty. At least you're doing it, but it's missing something. Now what is that secret ingredient? Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The true believers have come to succeed. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ And then the secret ingredient, خَاشِعُونَ The true believers have attained success. Those who have khushur. 
awe, humility, being overpowered, concentration, all these things in one word, in their prayer. So basically what, you're, what, what we're being asked to do is, I'm busy at work or I'm at home, my kids are playing in the background and now I gotta go make salah. As soon as I say Allahu Akbar, I have entered another dimension. It's like I went through a portal, I'm not even there. I'm giving you like sci-fi examples because I'm sure you guys watch cartoons when you were younger, right? You've entered another dimension. That world doesn't exist for you. Your kids don't exist for you, your wife doesn't exist for you, your work doesn't exist for you. Nothing exists for you. It's just you and Allah. That's it. That's it. We have to enter that state when we enter into salah. Which is why it's recommended that you find a quiet place to pray. And you, actually my personal advice, it's not scholarly, it's just a tip. Is before you start prayer, stand there for a couple of minutes and let everything out of your system. You're, you're, just flush your brain. With all the thoughts that are running, just get them out. And then just engage yourself in prayer. And it, when you're going to pray, know what you're reciting. Even if you don't know Arabic, learn some vocabulary of what you're reciting and listen to talks, lectures, study tafsir of those few ayat that you've memorized so you have a deep connection with at least those ayat and the small statements we make Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la right? uh, Sami Allahu Liman Hamid these small phrases is not overwhelming vocabulary even if you learn one of those a week you'll be alright but learn that vocabulary and have a deep connection with that vocabulary because Salah really is a conversation between you and Allah so long as your prayer is okay I don't care if you're at work or you're at play or anywhere else. If your prayer is okay, you're connected to Allah. Your prayer is weak, you're disconnected to Allah, even if you're in the masjid. Even if you're in the masjid. If your prayer is distant, and you're not concentrating in your salah, and you're not overwhelmed in the salah, then you're, then you're still not connected to Allah. So it's, it's not your work that's the problem. That's what my answer to the question, and Allah knows best. It's not work that's the problem, it's concentration in the prayer that's the problem. Um, question from you guys, inshallah ta'ala. Anyone from the massive audience? Okay, I'll take one from uh, brother over here, inshallah. My question is for you. Uh, I'm a new Muslim. Just uh, took my uh, shot about a month, month and a half ago. Mm -hmm. I just lost my job about a week ago. And that's been really tough for me. For me, it's kind of pushing me away. What's bringing me back? What's making me come here and, you know, mm -hmm. keep my praise to Allah? This is actually a very powerful question and it takes many shapes and forms it's not just your specific question uh, I'll give you a similar question you have um, I had a I used to work at a mosque at a masjid and uh, a young man came to the masjid his mother had just passed away and he came in and he said why is Allah doing this to me why is this happening to me right and it's a similar question why is it that even though I am Muslim I didn't do anything wrong why are these bad things happening to me the, the issue here, the, the fundamental issue here is our definition of what is good and what is bad. In the previous discussion I mentioned, Allah Azza wa Jal says, it may be that you really like something but it's harmful for you, and it may be that you really detest something but it's good for you, right? But this, <coughs> this reliance on Allah, acknowledging that Allah knows better what's better for me than even I know for myself, and that He cares more for me than anyone in the world would care for me. Allah loves his, his believing slave more than anyone else will love him. This is actually the promise of Allah. يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي Tell them, if you love Allah, then follow the messenger. He's saying, follow me. Allah will love you. So when Allah loves, you can't compare that love with anybody else's. There's not any comparison. No mother will love her child like Allah loves his slave. There's no comparison. So first of all, understand Allah is not putting us through anything out of spite or hatred or abandonment or anything like this. And I could tell you a much worse scenario. You have, I mean, there, there are many, but just to pick a few, you have the Messenger wasallam. I mean, who will Allah love? Who does Allah love the most on the face of this earth is His Messenger wasallam. He gets revelation. And He delivers it to the people. And He loves to get revelation. It is the most beautiful experience for Him. But then there's a period where he stops getting revelation. There's a gap. There's a gap. And the people who he constantly invites through revelation, they say, so uh, nothing new today? What's going on? Running dry? Oh, your Lord doesn't like you anymore? They start taunting the Messenger Wasallam. They start taunting him and hurting his feelings, really deeply hurting his feelings. And still no revelation is coming, no revelation is coming. 
Now, imagine the, the sense of concern and the fear. Maybe Allah is in fact disappointed with me. Maybe I did do something wrong. Allah reveals consolation and He says, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord didn't abandon you. Your Lord didn't you know, bid you farewell. And He didn't leave you aside. He's not displeased with you either. So Allah sent him consolation. The first thing to note for a believer who's in distress, in worldly distress, your real consolation is in the Qur'an. You read the word of Allah sincerely, sincerely, and you will found, find counsel in it. You will find advice in it. You will find comfort in it. You will find the struggles of those who, who, who suffered much more than you, much more than you, and Allah helped them. Like for instance, take the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. We just look at it as, as a story, we don't see the power in it. I mean, imagine a kid, an, you know, an 8, 9, 10 year old kid, being thrown, kidnapped by his own brothers and being thrown in a well in the middle of the woods and being left alone. Can you imagine the terror this child is going through? Subhanallah. And then that same child being sold off as a slave in a different country with apparently no chance of getting back with his father. No chance of getting back to his family. This is a horrible, horrible tragedy. If you hear about something like this in our times, some kid was left in a well. Right? How, how deeply disturbed would you and I be? Right? Because that's real to us. But when we read the story, we say, yeah, I know what happened to you. So he was thrown in a well, and then the caravan came. And it's just a story to us. But this really happened. And it's a horrible tragedy. And then this man gets sold off as a slave, and then for something he didn't even do, what happens next? <laughs> he gets thrown into prison. For multiple years in a jail. With a bunch of criminals, obviously with criminals. It's not like he's living in a nice neighborhood. Right? So now, you, you know, and we, look, we read bits and pieces of his story, but even they're powerful enough to shake us up. But yet, what does Allah say? Wallahu ghalibun ala amrihi. This is a very powerful phrase and it's a recurring theme in Surah Yusuf. Allah was overlooking and was dominant over his affair. And then to couple that, Allah says, Wallahu latifun lima yasha. In Allah, latifun. In Rabbi latifun. My Lord is subtle. My Lord is subtle. So there's two things. He's dominant, overpowering, and also subtle. This is impossible for anyone other than Allah. What do I mean by that? Like if you know you have a, 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 a boss who's overpowering over his employee, he's always hanging over his shoulder, he's always kind of bossing him around, micromanagement we call it, right? You could obviously see the boss's influence constantly over the employee. And if a boss is subtle, laid back, takes a back seat, he works in a subtle way, then he's in his office, he may be watching, but he's not letting anybody know that what's going on, he's subtle. Allah is both at the same time. He's in charge of everything that's happening to Yusuf salam, and at the same time, because it's invisible, Allah is not in the scene, he's in the unseen, it's, at the same time it's subtle. But because it's in the unseen, and by the way, the first entrance into our faith is what? Those who believe in the unseen. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Because that's in the unseen, the workings of Allah, the plan of Allah, that we feel like Allah has abandoned us. That's what the feeling that one gets when they're in distress. But it is at that very moment when we are in distress that Allah really tests who are the people who believe and who are the people who only believe when times were good. By the way, this is a fundamental modern Christian idea with a lot of Protestant groups. There's this idea that if you're doing good in this world, it's because God loves you. Okay, if you're doing good in this world, you got a good job, you got a house that's paid off, family's good, health is good, means God loves you. And if you lost your job, and you can't get a job, and you're homeless, and this or that, or the other, maybe it's because you're out of the grace of God. God, you know, doesn't love you, etc., etc. But our position on this is entirely different. If you're wealthy, or you're absolutely in abject poverty, right? Either way, we, we believe that Allah loves both of them, and rather, Allah is testing both of them. It may be that somebody's wealth and luxury is a means to their destruction. We know in the Qur'an of people that were so wealthy to open their vault, like Qarun, you need multiple people to open the vault. And nowadays you have a, sh a show I heard about, some, some brothers told me, there's a show called Celebrity Cribs, where you go into these famous people's homes and they show off their incredible mansions and stuff like that. Who has a bigger crib than Fir'aun? Right? Who's got a bigger palace than Fir'aun? The pyramids are still, I mean, talk about architectural integrity, right? The, the, the structures are still around. They're a world monument. This was his house. This is where he lived. I mean, talk about a nice place to live. Yet, are these examples of successes or failures? They're examples of failures. 
So really the, the absence or presence of wealth or health or youth or any of these things are not a gauge of success or failure for, for the Muslim. All of these are tests. All of these are tests. It's not that wealth is bad either. Wealth can be good too. And it's not that poverty, is bad, poverty can be good too. The thing that we can say definitively about them is both of them are a test. To test whether we truly believe or not. Do we, when we get wealth, do we misuse it? Do we overspend? Do we, not, do we not care? We feel like, oh, I, I can make a lot of money. I'm very qualified. You're not qualified at all. There are people much more qualified than you that can't get a job. Right? And if you run a successful business, there are people that are much more skilled than you at running a business that have failed. It's not because of your skill. And it's not because of your resume. It's not because of your degree. It's because Allah is providing you. And when He wants, He doesn't provide. He could take an economic system that is like it's... You couldn't imagine it crashing in the way that it did. It wouldn't fathom. If you said it the day before, if you would say it to someone, or the months before, if you say it before the housing crash, oh, I think everything's going to pop. This whole system is going to pop. We're gonna, the stock market is going to be in the 6,000s. So, what are you, crazy? That's not going to happen for 50 years. That's never going to happen. You're insane. You're conspiracy theorist. Subhanallah. How Allah turns the face of the world around in just, just the blink of an eye, letting us know that it's not us that ensure our provision. That it is He who's in charge. There's another, there's Wallahu ghalibun ala amrina. He's dominant over our affairs. To briefly answer your question, inshallah, now, this idea of, you know, uh, what reason do I have to turn back to Allah? Actually, perhaps Allah took some worldly things away from you, so you learn to rely more on Allah. What is a slave to do but to rely on Allah? We are the, we're the continuation of the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He, his, the essential teaching he has is he relies only on Allah. He calls on only Allah. He doesn't even say, I feed myself. He says, He feeds me. He gives me to drink. He guides me. Right? He gives me life, He'll give me death. So there's a complete, complete, absolute reliance on Allah in the most impossible situations. I mean, I have kids, right? I, if I leave them at the mall or at the school, right, and I forget to pick them up and I'm a half hour late or something, then my wife would go crazy. Oh my God, where are the kids? What's going on? Where does he leave his wife and kid? <laughs> In a desert. Absolute death. And he's walking away. Why? What's he relying on? Water to come out of nowhere? No, he's relying on Allah. He's relying on Allah. That's his only reliance. Nothing else. So this is really, Allah puts us through these tests so we can show our reliance on Him and then He opens doors that you couldn't even imagine. And we have to have good expectations from Allah. This is what makes the Muslim different from other, other people. We never expect bad from God. Allah says in the hadith, he said in the hadith Qudsi, he says, I am as my slave assumes I am. If you expect Allah to keep you healthy, you will stay healthy by Allah's permission. If you expect Allah to provide you, He will provide you. If you, you have good hopes in Allah, don't have bad hopes in Allah, because then Allah will make your bad hopes come true too. Because that's what you wanted. That's what you asked for. That's what you expected. So we should have, all of us should have good expectation from Allah. The most thing we ask Allah for is to remain on guidance and to remain patient with whatever He sends our way and to give us strength to bear through those tests. May Allah let us pass all of our tests, inshaAllah ta'ala. I listen to lots of hip-hop and watch MTV Cribs. Hey, MTV Cribs. We just talked about that. I can't seem to focus on getting close to God. What's your advice? Stop watching MTV Cribs and don't listen to hip-hop. Uh, it's probably a good start. Um... Okay, I don't have a uh, bias against any particular culture or uh, genre of music, etc., etc. I have, you know, strong uh, objections to music per se, though there's some scholarly discussion about it, but I will show you what I'm convinced of. I think nowadays music is probably one of the easiest means to lose your moral sense. It is, music is audio pornography today. That's what it is. It's explicit. It's shameless, it's vulgar, it takes your sense of humanity away from you, it makes you look at women as objects, worse than objects, worse than animals. Just ask, and then these people are talking about women like they're talking about, you know, uh, an animal, really. It, it, uh, it objectifies women, and especially I've noticed a lot of the brothers that I know of Muslims that are really into the hip-hop scene, and they're kind of doing the hiv of the, the song, Right? They're memorizing the song and they're really good at reciting it with perfect tajweed too. Right? And so they, they do that and it's just horrible language. Horrible, horrific, horrific language. You know, the only simple response I have to that, if you have any regard for the book of Allah, that you really think it's from Allah, بِئْسَ لِسْمُ الْفُسُوقُ بَعْدَ الْإِيمَانِ 
even the name, the mention, the word of something, the word for something bad is terrible once you have faith. Even the mention of something terrible is, is horrible for you, it's harmful for you after you have faith. You have to have a clean tongue. You have to say what you say. Tell my slave to say that which is the best. Say what is the best. Say good things from your mouth. So this is the first thing. When you say horrible things and you say things that are in direct contradiction to the moral gauge Allah gifted us with, then obviously you're, you're, you're deviating from your natural fitrah, your predisposition to turn to Allah. And when you constantly you know, listen to garbage like that, then you get deviated. And you don't find pleasure except in disobedience to Allah. And that's the sign of a sick heart. So one has to distance themselves from this. This is the first step. And I, I'll tell you, what, this is my personal measure. This is not a fatwa. This is, it's my personal analysis. You don't have to take it. But if a person finds listening to the Qur'an annoying, after they've been listening to hip-hop and this and that for a long time, and as soon as somebody puts the Qur'an in the car, you know what to say? Oh man, turn that off, man. I, I, I don't want to... I would just want to talk. And they immediately, they, they get a little annoyed when they hear the Qur'an. That actually means the shayateen have taken over. And they're constantly making waswas out of this person. Because what do the shayateen hate the most? It's they hate the Qur'an. They hate the word of Allah. They, they flee, it hurts them. So you know what they do? They, because this person has let the shayateen, the devils into his heart, they start pinching at his heart when he hears Qur'an. And he says, ah, I don't want to hear this. Right? It's like surgery, it's like pulling a tooth for this person. This happens. When you try to give this person a reminder from Allah's word, they get annoyed by it, like agitated, like an allergic reaction. Why? Because they've let the shayateen in. To let them out, the first thing you got to do is stop supplying them with fuel. This is fuel. This useless uh, wasting of time, this is fuel for shaitan. They love that you waste your time. They love it. Because the, the one asset, the, the one piece of wealth Allah gave every human being is time. And what is music and TV and YouTube and Facebook and MySpace and like Twitter and whatever else? If you're spending hours and hours and hours on this stuff, what is it except destroying your time? It's taking that one asset away from you. Shaitan would love nothing more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the strength to get away from these temptations. My advice that I keep going over, I can't get enough of giving this advice, find better friends. Find company that is not into these things and try to spend more time with them and inshallah you'll wean yourself off of these habits. Bi-idhnillah. Hi, can you give me advice? I'm a new Muslim, but I can't seem to pray five times a day. It's because it's been a year now, but does God really even care if I pray five times as long as I'm doing good, right? Hmm. Two things here. The, there are actually two statements which are two different problems in the question. The first problem is, Bismillah the first problem is, I can't pray five times a day. I can't do it. Now, I don't believe you. Whoever said I can't do it, I don't believe you. You know why? Uh, because I believe Allah. And now I didn't say I believe in Allah. I said I believe Allah. There's a difference, right? I believe in Allah means I believe Allah exists. I believe in Him. But when I say I believe Allah, it means I believe what He says. He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah does not burden anyone except unless they are able to carry that burden. This is what Allah said. Allah said He does not burden anyone with any responsibility unless they are capable of living up to that burden. This is what He said. You're saying you're not able to live up to a responsibility that Allah gave you. Isn't that true? You're saying, I can't pray five times. It's too much. And Allah is saying, yes you can. So I have a choice between believing you and believing Allah. And perhaps, if you didn't realize this, maybe you're lying to yourself. Maybe you've convinced yourself because of your laziness, because of your lack of will, that you don't want to pray five times. Maybe you have to, I, I can't judge you. I don't know what the problem is. But the problem, maybe you're ashamed to pray in front of non-Muslims. You know, people can take 15 minute cigarette breaks at work. Right? They can, they can take a break and just go hang out, do whatever. You can't pray five times a day. Subhanallah. There, I mean, in this part of the world, where I used to, you know, when I used to work in New York City, I would see Muslims praying all over the place. In the middle of Fifth Avenue, on the curb, the guy is making salah because it's time. Or, you know, at the, in, the, in, the, in the university, you open the copy machine room in the library, and there's like three guys praying right there, making salah. Muslims will pray. If there's time, we're going to pray. That's it. We're going to pray. So there are no excuses. That would be the cops. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Alright, okay. 
So that's the first thing. Allah said you can. If so, if Allah gave this burden upon you, and He did in fact, then you can. Convince yourself of that. And, and rely on Allah, He'll make it easy for you. The second question is, does He really care? Does He even care if I pray or not? Now this question is actually more about, does He need my prayer or not? You're forgetting that the prayer isn't for Allah. It's for you. It's not for Allah. If all the people in the world, all they did with their life was pray to Allah, it would not make Him any richer. And he, his, it wouldn't add to his kingdom because he already owns all of kingdom. And if no one mentioned Allah ever again, it doesn't diminish his dominion, his kingdom, his glory in any way. He doesn't need us. We need him. We need him. So the question is, do you feel like you need to pray? Do you feel like that's a need in your life? And if it's not, if you feel you're free of, you know, begging Allah for his help, turning to Allah and submitting before his commandments, then that's a serious problem with your faith. It's become weak and this question only came up because you've been distanced from Allah for so long that shaitan can come to you and say, yeah, I know you used to feel bad about not praying. Let's just get rid of that bad feeling and replace it with, well, why do I have to pray anyway? That's the next phase of that disease. The first part was at least it was diagnosed, but at least you had some bad feeling. Guilt was still there. That's a gift from Allah. When that guilt even goes away and you say, ah, Allah doesn't need my prayer. It's all good. Why do I, so long as I'm doing good. And that's the last part I want to talk about. This so long as I'm doing good part. Who defines what's good? There, there are two kinds of good in this world. Please remember this, okay? There are two kinds of good. There's ethical good. I'm good to my neighbor. I'm honest at work. I'm nice to people. I don't steal. I don't cheat. You know, I'm... These are ethics. Basic ethics, right? That everybody... I, I tell the truth. I'm honest. I pay my taxes. Blah, blah, blah. These are ethical truths, okay? And I'm honest in business. Then there are religious goods. I go to Hajj. I give zakat. I pray five times a day, I fast in the month of Ramadan. These aren't ethical realities, these are religious goods. Good deeds that are religious, and good deeds that are ethical, moral in nature. What happens a lot of times with Muslims and with non-Muslims, especially it happens with Muslims, is that we make a distinction between these two things. So in the Muslim world you will find people that are morally good. They're nice to their family, they take care of their kids, they're responsible in the household, they're nice to their neighbors, they're honest at work. Good people, but guess what? No religion. I don't need religion to be good, is what they say. And on the other extreme, you have people that pray, go to Hajj, give zakah, have a long beard, dress in a very religious garment, and yet, terrible to their family, cheating people in business, highly immoral and unethical. So what's happened is we have separated the two dimensions of goodness. Moral goodness, ethical goodness, and religious goodness. What Allah does in the Qur'an is, fuses them together in the ayah, this one ayah, it's called Ayatul Birr, the ayah of goodness. What does it mean to be good? If you study that ayah, it is a combination of two things. It's a combination of ethical principles, like fulfilling your promises, being patient, perseverant, you know, and also religious goodness, establishing the prayer, giving the zakah, right? So it's, it's a combination of both of those things in one place. So if you think you are in a position to define what good is, most likely you're sticking to moral goodness. And you're undermining religious goodness, like the rituals that Allah taught us. But what Allah wants is for us to have both at the same time. This is when a person is truly good. Otherwise, you're not really good. You, are, you have defined goodness for yourself and you have rejected Allah's definition of it. But we turn to Allah for guidance because we can't define things for ourselves. We want Him to define them for us. Inshallah ta'ala. Okay, last one. Alhamdulillah. How can I get my wife to take hijab serious? It's been a few years now and she still won't put it on. She thinks it's, a, it's no big deal. Uh, don't tell her about hijab. Stop talking to her about hijab altogether. Uh, what you do is you talk to her, or actually don't, you don't talk to her because what happens oftentimes is the, pers the people least effective with, the, with uh, da'wah are members of the family. Like they would much rather listen to a stranger and actually take their advice than listen to someone in their family. It's much harder for me to give da'wah to my own cousins because ah, it's just no man again, he's talking, yeah, it's something on YouTube or something. Right? Because uh, I'm just another, just a guy from home. No big deal, right? So this is actually a problem for speakers too. They can give da'wah to the world, but guess what? They got to get somebody else's tape and somebody else's CD to put in the car when they're driving. I want to hear you, I hear you enough. <laughs> right? This happens. 
This even happened to Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Abu Han the whole city of Baghdad is coming to him to ask questions. His mother says, you don't know anything. I'm going somewhere else to find out what the answer is. And the where she used to go for the answer, that guy was a student of Abu Hanifa. <laughs> so he would know the answer. He'd say, I'll do my research and get back to you. He'd come to Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. He would say, tell her this is the answer, but don't tell her it was from me. And he would go back. Right? So the first thing is, acknowledge that a lot of times religion, when you try to give it to your family, you have to be a little tactful. You have to be a little, you know, have more strategy, basically. Find a really good speaker about the hereafter, the day of judgment. The biggest problem for your wife, first of all, is not hijab. Hijab is a symptom, not the disease. The disease is a weakness of iman. How do you strengthen iman? You strengthen iman with reminder. What's the most powerful reminder? Quran. If you look at the ayat of reminder in the Quran, what are they always talking about? The hereafter and the destruction of the people in the past. This is the powerful reminder. People that didn't listen, look at what happened to them, look at what's going to happen to them, right? So for example, the series, a series on the hereafter, right? Somebody going, giving a really powerful khutbah on, you know, how human beings have to struggle for salvation, a powerful reminder from Quran. If you make that a culture in the, in the family where every day, 15-20 minutes, we're going to listen to something from the Quran in a powerful way. Right? There's plenty of, uh, of speakers and resources available nowadays that you can listen to. Like, uh, you know, the Awlaki series on the hereafter is great, I think. You know, uh, um, and I, I know, actually know people that got off their mortgages after listening to that CD. You know, they got out of riba. It's was, it was that powerful. So, you know, take advantage of those kinds of resources and understand that you are not always the best means of da'wah to certain people. Certain people need to hear it from somewhere else. And, you know, we can't make da'wah to everyone. There are some people we have an effect with, some people we're completely useless with. Right? So everybody has their audience. So inshallah ta'ala, that hopefully helps you with the situation of uh, your spouse. And uh, last thing I should say about that, my, uh, my gut feeling is her problem isn't intellectual. Meaning it's not like she's not convinced it's important. It really is, she doesn't see the seriousness of obeying Allah in every last commandment. That's the real issue. Once that's resolved, hijab is going to come anyway. And among other things, inshallah ta'ala. All done? Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka. Wa natubu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Subhanallah. Walhamdulillah. Wa la ilaha illa Allah. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Walhamdulillah. Wa la ilaha illa Allah. Allahu Akbar.